first I'll justify, I'll thank you for staying so late and, and <coughs> I'm the last one between you and these great Sufganiyot that are outside. So I just took this picture outside. So this is really waiting for you, unless the people that left here early ate it before that. <laughs> Um, and so um, I'm, uh, it was a, a recent recruit at the Technion, we started a year ago. Most of the data that you'll see here uh, is from a uh, postdoc at UC Berkeley. Uh, and the data that is from the Technion, because we already have some data, I will mention that, I'll point that out. So I would like to talk about, and was brif briefly mentioned earlier today, about perovskite nanocrystals. These are special new materials that we kind of are very excited of. And uh, quantum connection here, here is the fact that we really, really hope that uh, we can use these materials as signal photoemitters. And I'll kind of try to do that as quickly as I can in order to get you out in time. So uh, what is a single photon emitter? Ideally, what we're talking about or what I'm talking about in this talk is something very simple. I'm talking about some material that on demand will allow us to exa emit exactly one photon at a time and we then can use these photons, or these stream, this stream of single photons to um, run a, a very simple experiment of an interference pattern. So it's essentially demonstrating that these photons, these single photons, are indistinguishable. So that's, what, that's the, the only thing I want to do with these materials. Now, why do I want to do that? So it, we're in a quantum uh, center retreat. So we already heard a lot of talks about quantum computation, a little bit about quantum information. So there are a few examples. I'm not going to talk about these things, but there are a few examples that single photon sources could be very useful uh, in these quantum uh, context. And there are already a couple of very uh, established solutions in the solid state. So there's one way to get quantum, one way to get single photons is to use lasers and just attenuate the lasers. And there are a, a, a few ways to do that at work, the parametric down conversion and so on. There are four wave mixing. There are a couple of ways to do that that's very, very well established. I'm talking on a different genre. I'm talking on solid state indistinguishable single photon sources and also for that there are a few established examples. Uh, a few of them were already mentioned in this uh, day today. Uh, these are the color centers and diamonds. They, they were, these were discussed. Uh, there's also a genre of quantum dots, epitaxial arsenide-based quantum dots, Dudi Gershoni, <laughs> that was er here earlier as a world expert in this. And from these uh, quantum dots you actually can get single photons. The, these are indistinguishable single photons. You can do entanglement. You can do very nice things with these systems. Uh, we're not competing with these samples. We're just showing another example and you will understand pretty quickly why this example is very interesting. So we're talking about colloidal perovskite quantum dots. These are solution processable materials and According to recent publications, these are really new materials, so according to very recent publications, you can actually get coherent single photons from these materials. And we're talking about a paper that was published this year, so really soon, uh, but it did show a very exciting example in which you can actually take single photons from these quantum dots and run a, through a Fourier spectroscopy, run some uh, interference uh, experiments, and you can actually extract the um, coherence time of this system. And these are 60 picoseconds, where T1, so the overall uh, decay rate for this uh, material is around 200 picoseconds. And this was run at 4 Kelvin. So this kind of a, so of course this is a, a cartoon, and in the paper you can see all the data, but this is not, this is only the motivation for this talk, okay? So we're talking about these materials, these are new materials, and I didn't say that, but I'm in the material science department, so I would like to talk to you about these materials. And these uh, perovskites, I'm not going to teach you all about that, I'm just going to show you a few nice pictures and kind of get you uh, into the mood of going home. So uh, these perovskite structures are, are, are crystallographic structure that is known actually for many, many years. It, it comes out as in nature as, an, as a mineral, especially these uh, oxide perovskites. And the structure is, looks, something like, looks something like that, where we have these octahedra 
of some heavy metal, in our case it's lead, it is surrounded by the anion, so negatively charged ions. In our case, these are chloride, bromide, and iodide, so halides, and they encapsulate a, a big cation, which in our case is a cesium atom. So this is an all inorganic perovskite structure, which has this very interesting um, um, structure. And now, these materials, they can look kind of boring here, I agree, but, uh, and they're known for many years, but in the 80s, people discovered that they actually have very interesting physical properties. Some of them actually won Nobel, Nobel Prizes, such as high TC superconductivity, magnetoresistance, and fellow electricity. All of these were uh, um, demonstrated in the oxide family. We're talking about the halides family, and these were, these materials, this family of halide perovskites were popularized recently because people were able to demonstrate very efficient optoelectronic properties for these materials, mainly in solar cells. We're focusing on their ability to emit light. So people also demonstrated that they can em emit a lot of light, very efficient LEDs, very efficient lasers out of these materials. And we're exploring these materials at the limit of the smallest crystals that we can make. And this is the work I started in Berkeley following this paper in 2015 by Maxim Kovalenko from ETH Zurich. And he demonstrated that very simply, in solution, in a chemical synthesis, you can actually make these very small cubes of the perovskite structure, so lead halide perovskites. These are, and they have very, very surprising properties. And we're, if we're talking about nanocrystals, usually, you'll have to work very hard in order to get them to emit light because they have a lot of surface to volume ratio, there's a lot of surface defects, you have to take care of all of those surfaces. But in the case of the perovskites, this is not the case. They actually, from synthesis, they emit a lot of light and these guys were able to demonstrate that from colloidal solution, you get more than 90% quantum yield, which means that in this sense, more than 90% of the photons that are being absorbed are being re-emitted from this semiconducting material. And these are also very, these objects are also very interesting in the sense that as a material scientist, you can really start study the material. So you can use a transmission electron microscope and you can see, see the microscope, the nanoscale uh, shape of these materials, but you can also zoom in and see the actual atoms. So we can really learn, and, and this is a electron diffraction, uh, uh, excuse me, this is a, um, a transmission electron microgram that actually corresponds uh, to the um, scattering that you get from these. So th what you see here is actually atoms and the brighter spots are actually heavier elements that scatter more electrons versus the brighter spots that are based essentially the halides. So you can really learn a lot about these materials just from looking on the mic uh, TEM micrograph. Um, so I already mentioned that these materials are special in the sense that they emit a lot of, of light and they're defect tolerant. So you don't really need to take care of all of the defects on the surface. But there's an, an, another property which was, which was very surprising, which is the tunability of these materials. So essentially, you can synthesize one type of these perovskites, essentially the cesium lead bromide, but then you can exchange the halides. So in solution, let's say you get this green emitting material, and this is what, what the picture, the nice picture you see here, is essentially a, just a vial of, of a suspension of these nanoscopic uh, crystals inside. They're just floating here in this solution. They're excited by UV light, and they emit visible light. And then you can change just the bromide to a chloride or to an iodide, and with that you can actually tune the band gap of the material. So you can actually play with the electronic structure of these materials post-synthesis, and this is quite unusual for a system, for a solid state system, especially if you're thinking about uh, the efficiency of this thing, you're breaking 60% of the bonds here, and you're replacing the atoms, and you still, throughout this process, this is still emissive. You're still, you're not sensitive to all of those traps, all of those defects, you're still able to emit light. So this is a very exciting system in that sense, and also in the sense of a single photon emitter that will be able to manipulate the material in such a way. So this is one thing that we can do with the system. Another very interesting thing, it, re it relates to the fact that thermodynamically the, there is a stable phase of these perovskite materials that actually separates into two-dimensional sheets. It's called a rodelson popper phase. Essentially, if you, uh, under certain conditions, and we'll not get into that because it's pretty late, you actually can get layer structures, and we did that at Berkeley, we found out a way to grow nanoplates out of these materials. And the interesting thing about these nanoplates is once you grow these two-dimensional structures out of these materials, 
you actually see a very big, a very large effect on the optical properties of these materials. And this is demonstrated in this plot here. So if these are the cubes, the, this is the absorption spectra, and this is their emission spectra. Once you grow a two-dimensional nanoplate, the exciton now is very strongly quantum confined, and you get a very strong blue shift in the emission and the absorption. And even the functional shape of the absorption changes, and you see this peak here, which is distinctive uh, um, this indication that you have a strongly confined exciton in this system. What's exciting about this is now you can take these and image them under the electron microscope, as I mentioned, and you can actually measure the distance. You can see here the atoms of a single. So these are these single nanoplates lying on the inside. So like a books on a shelf, they're, they're ordered like that. And you can actually measure their thickness. You can see the atoms. You can see a precise thickness of such a quantum well. And you can correlate the thickness with the actual amount of quantum confinement that you have in the system. And you we ran this experiment a few times figuring out how exactly to tune and to, to control the thickness of these structures. So what do you see here is the absorption and emission spectra of the nanocubes. And then if you grow a five unit um, nanoplate, you'll get a certain value of quantum confinement, a four unit cell, a three unit cell, a two unit cell. So each one of these is a, an integer number of layers of these perovskite structure as, and has its own uh, and it's a, a, actually, it's, it's an own quantum well, so it's an own discrete energy that you can see here. And, and the exciting thing about it is that this is a pretty bright system. So even down to the one unit cell, and we can actually see that today in our lab, you can grow this one unit cell of a perovskite structure, and you can see it with a, uh, a pretty standard fluorescent uh, spectrometer. So this is a pretty exciting system which is pretty bright and pretty defect tolerant. What exactly is going on with the quantum confinement in this system? This is a little bit late in the day to start to dive into this thing, but essentially I'll say it, I'll say it shortly, we don't fully understand. We, there, there's a lot of things in this system we don't fully understand. So one of the things is how exactly excitons behave uh, in these two-dimensional perovskite structures. There's a debate about them. What is clear is, and from this plot, you can see this is the additional confinement energy versus one over L square. So this is the naive particle in the box demonstration. So for the green data set, these are the cubes. You may see, you may say that there is a fit, but for the plates, which is the five monolayer, four, three, two, one, there's, a, it clearly doesn't fit the naive model of particle in the box. We're missing something here in theory. There is a big debate now in the community what exactly is going on. And you see the paper, FO space, this is one of the leading theoreticians in the field. A paper from 2018 describes the theory in the intermediate confinement regime, but it fails to describe the strong, strong quantum confinement regime, which is necessary for these very strongly confined exciton in the, in the place. So this is the story of the two-dimensional nanoplates. But we can actually go even more, and we can, we can grow, instead of plates, one-dimensional nanowires. And with this, I'm going to finish the, the talk. I'm going to show you a very nice demonstration how we can use the properties of one-dimensional nanowires. Technically, the growth of these in, colloidal, uh, in a colloidal process is very simple. We just let the synthesis run for a long time. And after a long time, instead of getting the plates or the cubes, we'll get these elongated one-dimensional nanowires. What got me excited about this system is the fact that it's very, very anisotropic. So we have a 10 nanometer thick nanowire, but it's microns in length. And for those of you that are interested or heard about semiconducting nanowires, usually they have polarized absorption, polarized emission. So I was set to, to see if these new structures that we were getting were displaying the same properties. Essentially, I conducted this experiment, which um, is just putting these materials under the optical microscope and rotating a polarizer. And the red dots you see here are from the nanowires, and the blue dots are from nanocubes, so with no anisotropy. And you can see there is a clear cosine squared theta dependence on the angle of the analyzer, which is an indication that we indeed have polarized emission out of this structure. Great, but the way that we were getting these were actually was, wasn't very satisfying. We were putting these materials into a polymer and stretching the polymer by hand. So uh, as you know, these anisotropic structures, when stretched in a polymer, they will align along the stretch lines. This is the picture that you'll see here. And those stripes you see are actually bundles of these nanowires under a fluorescent microscope. So I was pretty disappointed because we didn't really have a nice control 
on the materials that way. So we, we had this idea that we can use a 3D printer and extrude the polymer with the nanowires inside and through the extrusion process we're going to get alignment of these nanowires. So I wasn't, at that time I wasn't an expert in 3D printing so I teamed up with a Harvard group that, and they are experts in 3D printing and Jennifer Lewis, that's the name of the PI, and the, essentially what we came up, and this guy Nanja Zhao came with this beautiful Escher image, and the trick here was that. So he took this fish and a bird, and the fish he printed in the vertical direction, and along the direction of the printing, you'll get the alignment of the nanowires. So essentially all the wires in the fish are going to be aligned in the vertical direction, and in the bird, he printed them in the horizontal direction, so all of them are now printed in the horizontal direction. And this is the fluorescence image that you get out of this without a polarizer. You can't really distinguish between the two. You stick a polarizer and you can see the difference between the fish, which, is, which emit vertically polarized light, and then rotate the polarizer, you, you'll see the bird. So now you're basically translating this property from the nanoscale, 10 nanometer confinement, to something which is nanometer or millimeters in length. So this is a pretty cool thing. We're not um, limited to two angles. We can do the same thing with eight different angles, so eight, eight different intensity. We now get a three-bit grayscale or green scale, if you wish. And then basically you can take any image you want. You can decompose it to pixel, print pixel in each uh, orientation. You'll get different intensities. And through a polarizer, you can actually see the image. Take away the polarizer, you won't be able to see anything. So this is kind of a way to demonstrate that we have the ability to control the position of our nano elements wherever we want in space and time. We're not limited only to one color. I demonstrated earlier on that we can switch the halides so we can actually change the band gap of the material. So we can actually demonstrate an RGB pixel. So red, green and blue because we have the, the green is the bromide, the red is the iodide, the blue is the chloride. These are different types of the same perovskite crystallographic structure of different band gaps. And now we can print one, each one of these pixels in a different orientation, 60 degrees angles difference in respect to the polarizer. And essentially, once you stick a polarizer and you rotate it, you can actually multiplex the different colors. So you get from this pixel that was printed with a 3D printed that has the nanowire inside, different colors, and essentially a passive pixel, if you wish. So this is kind of to demonstrate what we were able to do and figure out in Berkeley during my postdoc. So recently at the Technion, we were able to, we got a wet lab, we were able to do all of, uh, of the things that we learned back there in, in, in the Gola. And uh, essentially, we were uh, able to reproduce zero-dimensional nanocubes. These are Cajola Van zero-dimensional cubes, one-dimensional nanowires, and two-dimensional nanoplates. So these are already published results from back then, but we were able now to do it here. And so what are we planning to do here with this thing? So I demonstrated that we can take these elements, we can control the exciton confinement, we can control the band gap. Now I demonstrated that we can control the position and the orientation of these. And now you can think about, in the context of single photon emitters, if we want to enhance them, now you have these photonic cavities or photonic structure, different kinds, but now you can, with this technique, you can basically position your quantum emitter wherever you want in space and test the different possibilities, different quantum conf different configuration in order to maximize your single photon flux. And with this, I would like to thank you for listening, to thank both uh, uh, the people I worked with in Berkeley, funding the Rothschild Fellowship, the Israel Ministry of Energy, uh, the DOE put a lot of money into this thing, this is uh, uh, some of the group of the Technion and some of the <coughs> students that just joined and Reut, Emma and Alina that are working on these projects and funding new funding from the Quantum Center, a loan fund and uh, the Green Detroit Chapter Fellow. Thank you for listening and staying so late.